There's a kid that is the best player in college soccer. Forget all of that. Just pray that they'll be all right in life. Arsenal game. In North London, once you come out your house, it's a completely different environment. We barely had conversations during that time. Myself, the whole family, we were affected. Zakawani's cross, any chance has scored! Steve Zakawani! I expect him to go number one the day I saw him play. You literally had somebody who was at the pinnacle of their career. Heard the impact very loud, like a firecracker. Someone just told me, you know, oh, Zach Wani got injured. I was like, shut up, man. You know, you're joking. When you can't play and do the thing that you most love to do, it changes your life. Um, they haven't seen me in a long time. We did this growing up, we're all here. Like, I haven't spoke to some of them in a year, two years, whatever, but you always have that. You see each other, it's like you never miss the day. So, even after playing pro and all of that, I never wanted to lose that element of just street football. Remember the game with Bushy? Steve rocks up, plastic bag, with his boots, <laughs> his boots in a plastic bag. <laughs> Takes off his boots, comes on. Within 20 minutes, yeah. we're free to up. It was different, man. Steve scored two, he scored two. <laughs> Why are all the tall guys in the front? I don't get yes. it. Being here, with them, like, I'm 29 now. I was in 16, 17, so 12, 13 years ago. We were not two miles from here, um, playing games, hoping for a future. So it's crazy being back here with them, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Best player um, ever played with, <laughs> hands down, Steve Zakani. I've played football 14 years, guy's a legend. Puts God first, friends first, and that's how he made it. From here, we played together yeah. to where he is now. Yeah. He's always been the same guy. Yeah. Love this guy. <laughs> Best baller. <laughs> I first heard about Steve some point probably in our, you know, call it spring of 2008. And one of my young agents had said, uh, you know, there's a kid out there, he's the best player in college soccer. And I said, who's that? He said, Steve Zakwani from Akron. His first impression was tremendous. Steve Zakwani, the dynamic winger from the Seattle Sounders, has really wowed us at times in his young career. He was an aggressive, attacking, skillful player. He's really intelligent too, and when you have that combination, I think he could play anywhere. I could easily have seen Steve playing anywhere in the Premier League. And then, you know, you got him on the field in those in those big open spaces. Here comes Zakawani now. Will Johnson trying to trap him. Eddie Johnson's in the box. Zakawani's cross. Eddie Johnson has scored! Third goal in four matches against the Portland Timbers. I had always felt he played uh, a bit like Henri because he played as a striker, but really he's always float out to the left side and get guys faced up. He was so talented that sometimes the game was easy for him. And uh, he would uh, play parts of the game. He wouldn't always play the whole game because it was so easy. He'd make his parts, he'd score his couple of goals, and then he would move on. He would create so many problems for opposing teams. They would really have to dedicate, you know, two and three players to trying to stop him. He could run with the ball and move faster than anybody else on the pitch. He was so dangerous, just as an offensive attacking threat. Completely dominating and leaving players, you know, looking foolish, silly with his step over and the crisscross and the quick change of pace and direction. He was the best left winger in the league, uh, hands down. What's it like to have this sort of support? There's nothing like it, it's amazing. I mean, best fans in the league for sure, and I love playing for them, and today's a great day for me. It's 
Steve was born on the 9th of February, 88. Very inquisitive, always on the move. Everything that he saw around, he was kicking. Yeah. African memories, man, honestly, very, very few. Uh, the main one I do have is um, um, being in some kind of school play, the war that was going on. There was a lot of unrest in the Congo, Zaire, at the time when I was born. It was very unstable. Uh, we had a president who was uh, about 25 or 26 years in power, and the political situation was not good. People wanted to change, and he was not prepared to give them what they wanted. An estimated 3.3 million people have been killed throughout the Democratic Republic of Congo, making it the deadliest conflict for civilians since the Second World War. The country was going down economically, politically, everything was uh, really uh, bad. And if I think back, there was an incident where soldiers had come into the house with rifles and machine guns or whatever into our house, our family house. So I remember that and then us moving was a big deal. The decision to come to the UK was taken in 1992. So Steve came to this country when he was four years old. Earliest memory I have of watching football is being on a family holiday in Butlins and the 94 World Cup, watching the final, Romario, Roberto Baggio, Brazil versus Italy. The emotion is bringing out from these two different nations. For me, it was incredible. And being Roberto Baggio on Monday morning in school, Eric Cantona used to have his collar up and just have swag on the pitch. I'm playing with my collar up too, and my dad's like, put it down like you're not him. I just loved everything about, um, about the sport. There's obviously millions of parks in London where kids just grow up playing. For me, this one is one of the most significant ones just because I lived across the street, played so many games here that felt like World Cup finals. I didn't know myself, to be honest, that uh, Steve could play football. My brother-in-law took them to a park. There was a team training in that park. Then Steve joined that team back in court. This was Sunday league football. So every Sunday, you pretty much play games. I think we trained like once or twice a week. He was the youngest in the group, but he was very good. He could dribble and score goals for fun. So that's how it all started. And I was playing every week, doing well. And one team used to beat us all the time. It was a team called Redbridge United. We felt that uh, with backing Colt, he couldn't improve. He joined Redbridge. With Redbridge, they were top. My dad was a big influence on me at that time. Big, big influence. I always told him, even if the team is bad, you must be best. That was my line. We won 3-0. I scored. We get in the car. You know, you miss the one in the 22nd minute. Or you, your control wasn't where it should be today. Your passing wasn't good. It was something. But it was always like, don't be satisfied. Redbridge, we played obviously 11 aside Sunday league football every Sunday. But during the summer, we joined tournaments, five aside tournaments. The family would go there, you bring the water coolers, the picnics, and you're just there the whole day, and just all these teams and kids playing tournaments. And teams would send scouts. Arsenal came. A scout from Arsenal came. Then that changed the, the whole thing. Well, Steve attracted us because he was very skillful. He was always very skillful. Had an eye for a goal. He was a good boy to work with. He loved football. I'm back at Hayland, which is the Arsenal training ground. Used to come here three times a week. I'm about to meet Steve Leonard and Roy Massey, two men that had a huge um, influence on my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Steve Leonard. I was a scout for the under-12s. I think he would have been uh, an under-11 then. So he was a year younger. Roy Massey. How are you? <laughs> All right, good to see you. Okay. Great to see you. In 15 years. Well, Steve was at the club when I joined. He was a very lively character. Um, Good ability and lots of confidence in himself. Tricky, very lively, on and off the pitch. You guys look the same. We look the same. Exactly the same. It's a compliment. Exactly the same. That was always up to mischief. Not nasty. No, none of them were. 
but I was tear-wise. You know, you had to keep an eye on them. On the pitch, that was great. But off the pitch, in the changing room, around it, you have to watch them all the time. And that group was like that, but, you know, they had personalities. Very small at the time, tiny player, but he could, you know, he, he knew the game really, really well. And uh, from then I knew, yeah, this guy's going to go all the way. Big man, Anthony. Good man, good. Good to see you, bro. 13 years, man. Listen. 13 years. After you, brother. 13 years. I remember Steve's time very well. His year group was very special to me because it was going to be the future. The school I went to isn't a normal school. Something normal in my school was seeing kids walking in the main hallway put in a firework in a year seven's bag, and you just hear the sound, and you know something's going on. Everyone starts panicking and running. We see his backpack, and he explodes, like kids are exploding in the middle of the hallway. Like, that's not school, but that was normal, normal. We've got in here a Glazemore alum uh, alumni, yeah, Hall of this. Fame. I did hear about this. I did hear about this. I think this. if you look, you might be able to find your face somewhere. Yeah, this is crazy. You know? I, I never would have thought that. In 2004, I ended up on the wall, like... At that time, it was, it was like a jungle. It was like the survival of the fittest. On my first week here as head teacher, uh, the deputy head was assaulted with a metal bar and they broke his arm in the corridor. A war zone, like a serious, serious war zone. That kind of violence brought terror into the school. Really, you can understand why parents wouldn't want their children to, to come here. There was always a report, a bad one. Bad, bad report from Glazemore. I nearly had uh, parent meetings there nearly every week. Yeah, I think yeah, um, there was my form class and stuff, my tutor class. On the bottom floor down there. On the floor there. on that side, yeah. He had an attitude which needs to be addressed. Oh, yeah. Miss Marmot's office used to be over there in the mm -hmm. corner, you know, like anytime you got in trouble, you yeah. never wanted to go over yeah. there. So yeah. I recall one day we were in the ed teacher's office. There were two chairs and uh, Steve was already in the chair. I said, what are you doing? This is not your house. And I slapped him in front of the head teacher. You are with your father. Your father has not taken the chair yet, and you're already sitting. I know he was a talented footballer, but in terms of academics, I don't know if he focused on everything that he could have while he was at Glazemore. His main focus, his mind, was football, football. He was one of those young men who was able to achieve, yet stay popular. A, an amazing combination. Obviously, somebody's on the rise in your school, so you're, you're kind of really a little bit proud of that, you know, like, oh, do you know Steve? Yeah, yeah, I know Steve. Steve's good at football. Bravo. Well, good to see you, man. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. We'll stay in touch with you 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He was not developing fast. He was small, so small. Nowadays, you look at kids and you say, well, some of the, the great players are small. But in them days, the problem was that transformation from 12s to 14s was a big step. We were back from training and received a call from Roy Massey saying, no, uh, we will not renew Steve's contract. He is a good player, but uh, we have, the, we have to, to keep the best. Oh, a total shock, a total shock. The big kids were the ones that were kept. Small, nimble, quick guys, all released, um, just not physical enough, they got pushed around. Myself, the whole family, we were affected. It was a difficult one because he was skillful and he did have an eye for a goal. And I think looking back, if we had that time again, we would probably have given him another two years to see how he developed physically. When Arsenal release you, you can go anywhere. It's like if you've been an executive at Apple, it'd be like, you know, leaving that high-end exec job and then your next thing is just like managing a petrol station. And I went to Leighton Orient, and with all due respect, a massive drop down. Two, three divisions below Arsenal, bored, not challenged. It's kind of like taking away something that someone loves you know, from them, and him not being able to do that made him do a whole bunch of other stuff. 
One of the things of my generation that we remember was the emergence of what today they call grime. I didn't walk more going to school, playing it, playing it. We used to listen to grime Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was non-stop seven days a week. I mean, this is sick. So we all start doing it. And sometimes I would miss training to go radio. Obviously growing up in North London, being a young boy, um, being sad truck is, there's a lot that happens. Once you come out of your house, it's a completely different environment. June 9th, 2003. This is the day we stole a moped, drove it right around there. Turned this corner, a car coming, crashed into it. Oh. Fell on the floor. I laid on my back right on this ground. Leg, you know, felt just like jelly from the knee down on the right side. First, I thought that it was a minor thing, but it's only when we went to the doctors. My dad asked him, you know, my son's a, a football player. Will he still play football? And the doctor told me, look, I have first to mend him for you to ask the question if he will play football. End up having two surgeries, and that's when like, my dreams just flash before my eyes. Yeah, I've ruined it because I'm, I'm not going to play pro. Then it was devastating. It was devastating. I just wanted him to play football. Everybody knows somebody, you think they're going to make it for sure, and then they don't. Once the knee was done, it was like, it's a wrap because uh, I was out for maybe 18 months, a year and a half or so, something like that. Oscar, a Dutch. I met Oscar when I was 10 at Arsenal, and we hit off. He texted me in 2004, August. He said, there's this guy called Abby who's starting a team. The team is only for 16-year-old kids who are talented but didn't get a pro contract. I got a call from Oscar. He said, oh, Abs, can I bring Steve training? I'm like, Steve, which Steve? He goes, Steve from Arsenal. I go, isn't he Alain Norin? He said, oh no, um, he had an injury. He hasn't played for a couple of years. I go, yeah, sure, bring him down. He picks me up from Bounds Green Station, two minutes from my house. When I last saw Steve, he was short, but Steve grew almost all of a sudden. And it's funny, because it's actually ironic, because the reason why Arsenal let Steve go is because he was too short. Touched the ball first time since the knee injury. Like, that, this feels good, like I haven't played. There's no pressure of trying to go pro, none of that. I'm just having fun again, like when I was five, six, seven, at Barking, at Redbridge. It feels like that. I'm just playing football. And he sits me down after like two, three weeks of being with him. Steve, you're too slow. You're not sharp enough. You're not fit enough. I'm from like Tottenham. Like, you don't just say that like to someone like, you're not this, you're not that. You don't just say that. He goes, but if you work with me, I'll get you to where you need to be. There was a few scouts coming from America. University of Akron, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, UNC, big college soccer school. Started coming to watch us train in a park. Just watching us, trying to find a diamond in the rough. We knew right away we needed to increase our talent. So we were combing the, the world, and we ended up uh, finding a guy that we had liked. Um, a guy named Oscar had seen his video over, and, and so we had gone over there to watch, to watch him play. And this is Oscar's showcase, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make Oscar look good. But Oscar was good. He was a good player. Um, but Steve-O was awesome. And, I, and Abdi walked over to me and said, uh, so what do you think? And I said, well, Abdi, I said, Oscar's good. I said, but who's that guy? So he came down, watched Oscar, loved Oscar, saw Steve, loved Steve, and they wanted both of them. They, 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 liked, they liked me, but obviously when you come training, um, you know, they saw me and Steve, and I think they wanted to bring both of us to, to go there. I decided, you know, so call Oscar the next day, we're gonna go, yeah, we're gonna go. Yeah, Steve, man, this is it, man, this is finally it, Oscar says to me, like, he's always thinking about, like, we're gonna play together, this is a big break. All right, you guys gotta submit your grades. Big red flag. I don't have the grades to get into the school. No, there's a way around it. Take the SATs. I had Steve take the SAT. Um, remember, uh, remember he had to get a certain score. And we show up there, this long line, and everyone's got to calculate and stuff. Like, I just came, just showed up. Nothing. No, we never pencil. Like, nothing. But I'm going to take this test to go to America. Get our scores a couple weeks later. Abby calls me. Steve, you need to come to my house. Abs, man, I'm at home. Steve, come to my house. I was thinking, Steve, maths, going back to school, I don't think he's going to make it. 
get there. He's like, Steve. And the Irish is so matter of fact, he passed. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know Steve was that smart, you know? I had no idea. So he got it, and I was like, wow, you know? Sometimes it's meant to be, you know, it's fate. You know, he's in, he's coming. Yeah, very happy for him, disappointed for myself, but um, it's football, you know? There's many different parts in football, and after that, I still played, you know? Abby took me to other places. I said, this is your chance. Um, let's buy the ticket, and you are going to, to Accra. Grime music in my Walkman. Fly from London to New York. Listen to the music. Missed the connection to Cleveland. Didn't hear the announcement. Go up to the counter. So the lady like, oh, where's my flight? Oh, it took off. Like, yeah, you nodding your head over there. Like, you missed it. Caught in New York City. Had to stay the night. And, and I remember thinking, oh, you know, he's not going to come. He's not going to make it. They put me on a flight to Chicago, then to Cleveland. Land two hours after a point in time. I'm in America. The coach, he's like, I'm in his house. He's got this big dog outside. I'm like, like, we're not doing that. I didn't know he was scared of dogs. So he was literally, when we opened the door and saw the dog, he almost ran away. <laughs> Steve came in January, so we had the whole spring to get ready for the season. I remember Caleb was needling me, saying, how good is he? He better live up to it, Ryan. When I saw him for the first time, I'll never forget, because um, uh, he got the ball, and he faced up our captain, Corey Sipos, who was the best defender, one of the best defenders in college soccer. And Steve-O got the ball on the left side on the wing and went right at him. And they're hiding, like, in the back office, watching to see. And I said, I'm sick. And I dropped their captain. Steve-O touched it by him, smashed it in the back of the net, and Caleb looked at me and said, OK, I think you were right. Now, years later, Caleb told me, when I saw that, like, I couldn't sleep for days. I'm now in Akron. I'm living in a house with three guys on the team, don't know them, left Tottenham. I'm here. But I'm gonna use this school to go pro. We were still speaking all the time. Like, Steve was just telling me how it was going in Akron. It's a different world completely. So Steve is used to going training, going and relaxing. But Steve has to go training, come home, eat food, and go to class. I'm like in heaven. Like, I just come from training in a park with Abby and them lot. And here I am, this, this is all available to me. The men's soccer team at Akron was, is very intense. Their regimen and their practices and their schedule was on another level. I felt like they were always elite people. Caleb, this young, arrogant coach, he's very intense. We played a school called Wake Forest, ranked number one in the country. He's like, guys, this number one doesn't mean anything. Here's what we're gonna do on Friday night. We're gonna erase that. And he starts doing that. But he wrote with a permanent marker, not coming off. So we're just sitting there, like the one isn't coming off. He's like, so you get the point. We're erasing them on Friday night. Something clicks. Things I was doing in training before, I'm doing in games now, scoring every week. He was single-handedly the most dangerous player in college soccer. Um, nobody wanted to play against him. We would get on the ball, and other teams would just, they would never get the ball back from us. The whole team was amazing, the entire team. But Steve he was a leading scorer. That second year especially, he scored 20 goals, and I think 15 of them were 50 or 60 yard mazy runs where he beat four or five guys. So it wasn't like he just scored tap-ins. He scored electric goals. And when he ran past me, I was like, wow. You know it's different when you see it, but then when you're actually playing against someone and you get to see their quality and, and how good they are in the pitch. He had just an, a, an ability to know how you were leaning one way and, and go. And then once he got a half a step on you, his speed and pace were, you know, fantastic. Probably the game that I most remember was when we played Ohio State. And uh, we won 4-3. He had three goals in the game. And Siggy Smith was in the stands. Think of names like Arsene Wenger, Alex Ferguson. Everyone knows them. That's Ziggy Schmidt in America. I heard about uh, this, this very good player who was at Akron. I probably drove up and saw him play at Akron six, seven times. The next day, Caleb emails me, because I didn't have no phone contacts these people. Let's meet at the student union. Me, him, sat down. Me and Caleb Porter sitting down. He's like, you're going to have opportunities to go pro. I think you should go. The next day, I sit in Caleb's office from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the phone with agents. 
There was a lot of buzz about him being one of the better players, being a Generation Adidas candidate at the time. I'm mean, not starting to hear numbers. Adidas, like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And I'm just like, this is unbelievable. This is happening right now. Contract gets faxed to Caleb's office. Five years, MLS, biggest contract at the time given to a college player. Sign the contract, give it to Caleb, he faxes it back. You're a pro player. I just sit there, crying. You know, from your five years old, that's what you were dreaming of. From Arsenal, Redbridge, Lane Orient, the moped. This is the only thing I wanted. I'm a pro. I have a five-year contract with MLS. I was just like, oh, okay, he must be good. <laughs> like, I know nothing about football at all. We fly up to St. Louis for the draft. Caleb next to me, nervous. Uh, I think I was experiencing it as well, and so it was my first as a head coach. Two minutes into it, nothing. We're sitting there at the draft, and then the buzz goes off, like a minute left on the clock. Seattle's made a selection. With the first pick of the first round of the 2009 MLS Super Draft, Seattle Sounders FC select from... Caleb gripping my knee, nervous. The University of Akron, forward and member of Generation Adidas. And from there, I knew it had to be me. Steve Zakoani. Number one pick. Walk on the stage, I'm on ESPN. Family's watching, people are watching, friends are watching. We are getting drafted. I watched that super draft all alone in my room in Holland all night long. This is insane. I mean, I wasn't surprised. I expect him to go number one the day I saw him play. As I said to my owner before the draft, I said, look, this is either going to be a huge hit or a big bust. It's not going to be anything in between. Pack my bags. You're off to Seattle. I arrive in Seattle, go to training. Casey Keller walks in. Like, nah, this can't be. I used to watch this guy. Casey Keller. I'm sitting on the rock of Freddie Lombard. But he played for Arsenal, the Invincibles that went unbeaten. He's my teammate. First training, I'm the number one pick ever. No one cares. Didn't mean anything. Held onto the ball a little bit too long. Hey, move the ball. I didn't even lose it or anything. But on me right away. Can't believe it. Different intensity. Check comes from Adidas. I'm not gonna check these numbers on the check. I couldn't believe it. That night, put the, slept with the check under the pillow, literally. It's just an amazing first month as a pro for me. I remember going to Seattle for his first game. The atmosphere was electric. First game in Seattle Sounders history. Sold out stadium against New York. This is crazy. Loud! Can't hear, literally can't hear a word the person next to you saying. You know, that, that home opener certainly rivaled, you know, a lot of matches that I'd seen around the world in terms of passion and intensity. And, you know, fortunately for the home crowd, you know, Seattle got up, they were 2 nothing, and then, you know, Steve did get to make his debut in the home opener. Come on, David, 60th minute. New York. Wow. We went free now. First game in franchise history when free no place goes crazy. Go home, put on ESPN, it's on there. Like, this is a different world. Oh, goodness me! Steve Zaccolani! Every time he would get a ball, you expect something to happen. Couple steps to the right. Chop down. Not only was he one of the prominent players of the team, but he was the one that would bring the most joy and excitement out of the fans. Ooh, that's my guy. I, I, I like that guy. That's the kind of player he was. It, there was just always excitement. Square ball, Zakawani, long touch, shot, and it's 1-0, Steve Zakawani. I liked him as a person. He was engaging, he was intelligent, you, you could talk to him. Uh, you know, the things early on when he came to Seattle, there were things in his game I wanted him to work on. Uh, he was a diligent worker do the extra stuff that was required to move yourself up to the next level. My 
second year, I was a team's top scorer. In my second year, as a left winger. There's no winger in this league that's that's as goal dangerous as Steve Zakawani is. I don't think there's any winger that can match his his numbers. He was playing extremely well. I uh, had a number of goals, a number of assists. And of course now teams were starting to watch him and sort of say, okay, hey, this is an interesting prospect. Break attendance records. Break sellout records. Most games on national TV. I think the realization hit him that, hey, I'm here now. This is this is big time. I remember a story, a situation with David Beckham. I'm walking out of the changing room and I kind of just look over and like, I feel like I'm in FIFA. Because I know this guy's face, but he doesn't know me. But I know him. Like I know, I know you, I know your kids, you're white, I know everything about you. He doesn't know who I am. And he kind of just looks and turns away. But I'm like, I can't believe this. It looks feels like a video game. Beckham. Scored that playoff goal. He had a great game, had a couple of assists to beat us 2-1. We lost. After the game, I go and find him. We shake hands, we hug, I'm like, hey, can I please have your shirt? And he like, kind of points, he's like, yeah, I'll give you one backstage back there because this one's going to charity. I'm like, okay, cool, he's done this a lot. He knows how to say no in a good way, no problem. I'll leave. Go back to the changing room, their kit man, Raul, who kind of, everyone in the league kind of knows Raul, walks in with four Beckham shirts. One to Freddy, one to Osvaldo Alonso, I think Ziggy took two. And follow him, like, Raul, where's my shirt? No, oh, no, David wants to give you your one personally. Like, what? I see Beckham coming. He gets right up to me, shake hands. He gives me a Beckham shirt, I'm holding it in my hand. Where's your shirt? No, I'm like, what? Now, where's your shirt? I'm like, I'm like, come on. And he's like, no, like, I collect shirts of players that I respect. Like, things like that for me, like, I'm telling all my friends that like, from back home, like, yeah, me and Beckham talk. And we don't talk, you know what I mean? But it's like, just we grew up watching him like that. So, this is where it could become more normal for me. Nearly everywhere in Seattle, you will see his poster. <laughs> everywhere. Or if we are in a supermarket, we will say, oh, Steve, Steve. People will come for autograph or for a picture or things like that. Here's a player who's playing at, the, at a super high level in Alaska. He was now playing for the national team for Congo. Um, and we had a lot of scouts from clubs watching him. Of course, the U.S. national team coaches are saying, okay, hey, can this guy play for the U.S. national team? Hey, I'm Steve Zakwani. This is my league. It was almost a killer mentality of, I am going to be the best. And then, in the sixth game, is when uh, the injury came. Steve's injury, um, I think, shocked a lot of us in the soccer world. Everything about it was weird. It was a Friday night, we never typically play Friday nights. Back then it was on Fox Soccer Channel. We were in Denver, Colorado. Someone just told me, you know, oh, Zach Wani got injured. I was like, shut up, man, you know, you're joking. I had my music on, went out, warmed up, fans booed, whatever. We did our thing, came in, Ziggy did his speech, we did our team prayer, we are going out to play. You know, it's hard not actually to get emotional about it because you literally had somebody who was at the pinnacle of their career. You always assume in sports that the guy's going to be okay. He's going to, even if it's a bad injury, he's going to be okay. Doctors do a great job now. Everything's going to be fine. So we would have never known in that moment that it might have been the beginning of the end. Go out, I mean, three, four, five minutes in, not more than that, I don't remember. So Steve got the ball and, you know, fully expecting him to beat somebody on the dribble. Ball comes to me on the left-hand side. Right back comes to me. I think I rolled it through his leg or rolled it by him. No, I'm gonna go. Out of nowhere, guy comes sliding in. The next thing I know, it seemed like uh, Steve's legs were like above his body. I don't even feel the impact. It's too quick. Happens, and then like I'm on my back. But I see my leg. I saw it. Broken right away pointing in the wrong direction. Heard the impact um, very loud, like a firecracker. Myself and Brian Schmitz are turning to our trainer and saying, get out there now, don't wait. I mean, it was, it was grotesque. It was flapping in the air. It was a really sad moment, you know, and I knew it was bad. It was terrible, you know. Uh, I, I was just thinking about his career, you know. I didn't want it to be over. 
that's way too young to be out of the game, especially when you just kind of got into it. Yeah, it, it was horrible. You never want to see a player get hurt like that on a football pitch alone, but someone that you know, to see that. Dead silence in the stadium. Now it's slow motion. I'm seeing the faces of the people on the Colorado bench, our opponents, people covering their eyes. A couple of my former teammates are playing for them now, covering their eyes, not looking. Referee coming. My teammates shoving the Colorado guy, like pushing him, whatever. And I'm there, my leg is in two places. Slow motion, no pain, nothing. The Colorado trainers and medical staff were there almost immediately. In fact, I think there might have been one or two there before I got there. They already were handing me a splint, and one of them said his leg is broken. And I'm calculating in my head, it's April, season's over in November. OK, no one's ever come back from this in five, six months. Your season's done. Cool. This thing's towards next year. I'm trying to stay positive stretching me off. And as he went off the field, it was confusing because I saw what happened, and deep down, I knew exactly what just happened. But Steve looked up, and he gave a thumbs up to everybody. And in my mind, somebody who just experienced that can't possibly physically reach their arm up and give a thumbs up to the crowd. Painful. Worst pain I've felt in my life. to the doctors and said his, his pain is increasing, it's not kind of stabilizing. Um, and they decided to rush him into surgery that night. They did an operation where they put a nail down the medial, uh, down the center of the tibia bone to stabilize everything. It's a very typical operation for that type of fracture. I just remember what mum felt like. She'd watch it over and over again, and it's just that feeling of helplessness, you know, you're however so many miles away from your son who just like got his leg shattered. I felt like she just, I, I, I have to be there, like I have to. Parents are flown in at this point. We went straight to the hospital and we found him there. Ooh. Short while later, a doctor comes rushing in with nurses. We have to go again. Complications. Steve developed a problem that was more serious than the fracture itself is called the compartment syndrome. With the muscle, uh, it's not getting any blood, it gets ischemic, um, it's not getting oxygen, and then it swells more and the pressure goes higher, mm -hmm. and the muscle can die. Come back, next day, third surgery. Come back, next day, fourth surgery. Four surgeries in Colorado, we didn't fix it. You gotta go to Seattle. How are we getting to Seattle? Adrian, sound is on a sense he's playing. Private plane. Those instants were very tough for all of us. Ambulance waiting for us, go straight to the next hospital. Surgery. A couple days later, surgery. As a fan, we didn't get a lot of information about what was really happening with Steve. Because we were hearing rumors that Steve got compartment syndrome. We're hearing rumors that things weren't healing, that he was having to have all these surgeries. I think I ended up having nine surgeries. After nine, like nine four, like we can't keep just going in. Medication every three hours, even through the night. You feel for Steve because you know that he's worked so hard. He's worked so, so hard. Yeah, I don't think he was even in a good place at that time. I think he was like maybe close to just being depressed. Email comes through, and the first line is that Steve is David Beckham. He just had played for AC Milan, had an Achilles injury. Told him his career was over, came back, won the championships, he wants to give me some advice. So we're like going crazy in the hotel room, like, oh, for all of this, like, this man's email has done this. <laughs> the night when I was in hospital, two of my friends, Stephen and David, took my mum to the next Seattle Sounders game after my injury. If you're watching Steve, you haven't been forgotten. Don't worry about that. Get well soon, come back to us quickly. Very, very defining moment in my life. Very defining. I told Ziggy, I ain't coming to training. I don't want to be around the team. I don't want to watch the Sounders play. I don't want to put no green training kit on. 
He had a fighting spirit, but as anything, when you have something like that, you're going to have moments of doubt. When you can't play and do the thing that you most love to do, it changes your life and it turns your, your life and your world and your norm normalcy of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis upside down. First couple months at home, they send Boris to my house, Russian, American guy, PT, physiotherapist guy. Every morning at like 8, 9 o'clock, wherever it was, I'd be so upset when I hear Boris's knock, he's here. Sessions were very basic because at first he was, uh, it was just the very beginning of weight bearing. He could barely put the weight through the foot. Put a couple goals on my fridge. Goal number one, get back your starting job. Be back in the starting lineup. Goal number two, score a goal at Central Link Field again in Seattle, our stadium. Those are your only two goals. You focus on that. I do remember first session when I introduced a soccer ball um, and we would just gently kick the ball to each other. And uh, it just coincided that that couple of Sounders players walked into the gym at that moment and he started kicking the ball just a little bit harder. It was kind of one of those small moments that I think um, were again very helpful from the psychological step, kind of saying, yes, I can. I still have it. I still got it. He had a fantastic attitude through it all. Uh, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could have done that. I'm doing the rehab. In my head, I'm coming back. From there, we go into the pitch. And I'm jogging, super slow, but I'm there. They're training, but I'm jogging. And then when I was finally ready, a few months out, I'll do a press interview. And the questions are like, you know, do you forgive the guy? And I'm like, yeah, I forgive the guy. All my energy was um, focused on getting better. It wasn't on um, having any kind of hatred or bitterness towards Brian Marlin. That's too much of a burden to carry. The energy I'm going to need to get back if I have any hope of resuming my career, I can't use it to be angry at this guy. I need everything pointing towards positivity. I was in no doubts that if it were possible for him to come back, he would. He would fight. From working with Randy and Chris, the physios, you progress to Dave. Dave is the final hurdle before you can get back. And I used to hate and love Dave at the same time. Push me. After some sessions, I'm throwing up. After every workout, Dave, this is the hardest workout of my life. Every workout, I'm saying that. I come into team training. First training, horrible. Uh, I was not sure if he was going to play again. Although I could tell he was making his way back, you could also tell that he wasn't quite the same as he was before. Ziggy comes up to me. He's like, Kohani, how do you feel? Uh, Coach, I feel fine. I think I've been training good. I feel fine. You can get some minutes tomorrow? Yeah, of course. We're playing Colorado. The same team I got injured against. I'm going to be on the bench. Wow. I can't believe it. Zakawani. We're playing Colorado, and the guy that had injured Steve was playing in the game. Mullen with the tackle ban for 10 games. Probably fitting in Colorado, but also, you know, I thought, oh, please, no, don't get injured again. It was so wonderful to see the crowd embrace him, and I think for Steve, too, it was so nice for him. I'm trying to get Ziggy's attention from the bench, like, I need to go in. This is the moment he put me in. Ziggy would not look at me. Steve had to play in this game. I started hearing the bell noise gathering. Thunderbolt. People stabbed that clapping. The game, nothing's happening on the pitch. They're going nuts in the stands. Nolan, a kid that comes and gives me the green shirt number 11 for the first time in over here. The noise level is just out of this world, it's incredible. I mean, and that was me watching it through tiny speakers in my laptop. Dave behind me, Zakwani, go up, you're in. What? I started, and I look over, and Brian Schmetzer, the assistant coach, who's now the head coach, is waving me over, like, come, they're in game mode. I'm like, I'm in. Someone in the stands must have saw it, the place that's going crazy. Go over to Ziggy. My his instructions to me. They remember what they were. Put his arm around me, speak something. You're gonna go in. You don't get goosebumps on your forearms at this moment. I don't know what it'll take. And 
go to the side and I plan this in the morning. If I go in, I'm gonna take the moment in. So I crouch down. Leaving the game for the Seattle Sounders, number 10, Mauro Rosales, and replacing him, number 11. The reaction of the fans that day was fantastic. An extraordinary moment, and Zakalani, there's a game on here, has gone into a position as a striker. He was a flying winger, but listen to the crowd now chanting his name. You know, I was just watching Steve. That's the only thing I was doing. I was just so happy, so excited. Play like three minutes, don't remember anything, even touching the ball or nothing. I don't know what happened. I mean, it was like fairly uneventful because it was toward the end of the game and, you know, he got a few touches and it wasn't like he came in and, you know, <laughs> took control of the game in the first second, but that wasn't really the first step. You know, the first step was just, just to get out there. You then think about the journey to for him to get to that point, what that person has done and what he's taken for him to get a few minutes onto the pitch just to live his dream again. So, yeah, you don't forget moments like that. The game ends, I didn't score, there's nothing. Cameras surrounding me. And then I see the guy that injured me. And in my head, I didn't even plan this. And I found him in the center circle. And I hugged him. There's the moment. And I whispered in his ear, like, let's trade jerseys. We switched shirts, sign of friendship, a truce. Closure for both men. It leaves you with goosebumps. It's something that, uh, you know, you try not to cry on the sideline, but it definitely brings tears to your eyes. Showing that, you know, um, forgiveness uh, in a way that I don't think, again, many people would be able to do was so powerful and was so beautiful. Walk away. His chapter's closed, my chapter's closed, let's move on. You know, I didn't know Brian. I remember at the time when the injury happened, being very angry uh, at him for that tackle. But I, I learned over the years that he felt really bad about it. Brian Mullen reached out to me fairly soon after the injury, probably within a month or two, and was very concerned about Steve's well-being. And then Ziggy walks in the next time I'm training. Steve, now that we got that out of the way, you're gonna have to earn your place like everybody else. Put me right back down to earth. And didn't see the pitch again for two and a half months. So Steven had this situation where his career had in a way died. And it wasn't because he broke his leg. It was also because of compartment syndrome, because of all these other complications and surgeries. So his career died, it took him 500 days, and he was able to revive his career and get back to a place that wasn't as good as he was before. But for a moment, it was actually better. The fourth game from a comeback is at home to San Jose. One of my teammates, Sammy Ochoa, gets the ball on the right-hand side. I see the play in my mind right now. I'm running the ball, so I'm like, no one's speaking about I can't believe I'm this open. I can't believe I'm this open. Sammy Ochoa pushed the ball across the box. One-on-one, -on -one, open goal. Can't miss. Strike the ball. Bam. Back of the net. You know how long I've waited for this feeling? To score in front of 40,000 fans. Like, it's there. Just done it. Take off running, celebrating. Running. Normally I'll have a celebration, a dance, I'll do something. No, I'm running. I know exactly where I'm going. I run straight to the bench, our team bench. I find Dave Tenney. And I hug Dave. And I'm shouting in his ear, like, thank you, thank you. Because he got me fit, got me back there. Received thousands of letters, emails, messages during the rehab. One from a young girl stood out in particular. She had messaged me. She says, you will learn to walk again, then to run again, and then to fly again. The next day after that goal, I went and got this um, tattoo to remind me of that journey culminated in that goal coming back. I remember her message really stuck out to me and it pushed me. That kind of injury you have, it's never straightforward. As in, when you have that kind of leg break, you have other issues, which happened to Steve, and Steve was so strong to be able to get through it. 
I've had injuries since my broken leg, groin surgeries, two of them in a six month span, hamstrings, quads. Before my broken leg, no muscle pulls. Now I'm having all these injuries, my body's different. I have to adjust to that. I will come to training two hours early just to get ready to train. The more successful you are, the more that everybody around you tells you that that success defines who you are as a person. And it feels good, but it's a trap, it's really dangerous. I'm a big reader. I read a lot on Steve Jobs at this time, 2014, and he had a quote that said, every day you have to wake up, look in the mirror, ask yourself, what I'm about to do today, is that what I wanna be doing? When the answer is no, for too many days, change something. I'm like, let me do this. The first day I'm putting up, and I'm like, nah, I don't wanna be going training. I just wanna stay home. Second day, same. Third day, same. Fourth day, same. Like, wow, it's been four days. I don't feel different. I went and saw Caleb, the man who technically brought me to the country, him and Ryan. I'm like, I think I have to retire. And he didn't dissuade me. I didn't want him to do it, you know. I just felt it was too early. People can say, oh, Steve, don't retire, carry on playing. But at the end of the day, Steve wake up in the morning, put in his boots, going out there. And I remember Steve told me, he goes, abs. Like, it got to the point where the pain was too much. As in, like, he'll bend over, he's in pain. He'll crouch over, he's in pain. As in, he's walking up the stairs, he's in pain. I announced the retirement. And that day is a tough day. Because I put the statement out on all across social media. I wanted to do it on my website, my social media. I pushed send and turned my phone off. Because I knew what comes next. And I just drove the car, driving around, thinking. Barking Colts, Renbridge, Arsenal, Akron, Abbey, Seattle. It's over. Balling like a baby. Thinking of all the people, teammates, friends, it's just, it's done, this is it, it's over. After I get everything out, drove home, felt peace. When he retired, I was just proud of him, because like, Steve done really, really well. Like, when he was playing in the MLS, he was one of the best players in the MLS. He excited the crowd, he played for his national team, he played at the highest stage. There's nothing I could do about it. All I wanted is to have my son uh, alive. Football is a, a chapter. It was not the whole book. So he could still write the whole book of his life. I was at home thinking, planning, started to write my book. Wrote a whole book in pretty much two months. Because it was 500 days from the time he broke his leg to the time that he came all back onto the pitch. I think it was a healing process for Steve. The fact that he could just write freely about all the emotions and the uh, the journey that he had been on. The year went by, next year came back, January 21st, and we normally start pre-season. Felt weird. For the first time in seven years, I'm not going anywhere. The hardest thing about retiring from a sport, and for us, soccer, is finding something else that you're equally passionate about. And unfortunately, we spent our entire lives passionate about this one thing. And I think people say, well, just find something else to do. But it's not that easy because soccer was an innate passion. It was inside of us from the beginning in our blood. Put the book out. First day the book comes out in Seattle, we'll do a signing at the pro shop. 300 people lining up at 8 a.m. What's going on? Start getting a bunch of speaking gigs. Start picking up. Everything starts picking up. I'm on TV, just live TV. Never know training, nothing. Talking about the game. And everyone's like, oh, you're good. You said that. I have no idea. I'm just there doing this. I've traveled the country just speaking. How? I don't know. But it's all just come since retiring. So now I'm a massive believer in just my gut instinct. He wanted to really start an academy for young football players who, like himself, were at a certain age but really didn't get the opportunity to have that second chance. That was talking about probably when Steve was about 17, I was about 16. He is a human being first and a soccer player second, and you see that in everything he's done. We're planning a fundraising dinner. I'm like, I'm not gonna stand up there in a black tie begging for money. No, let's do a game. We do a charity game. Every year we get together, former MLS guys, US national team guys, a couple NFL guys. We play a soccer game and we raise funds for scholarships in tuition, college textbooks, and soccer. So this year we've raised the most money ever, and the goal is to do 50 scholarships in the next five years. I don't think there's a day that goes by that he's not uh, running around doing something. He's just got a zest for life and very hardworking and, and a great leader. And I'm real proud of him. I still am completely tripping out about the fact that he has a mural on the wall. <laughs> he's just like, yeah, I'm going to take you like past to see this like mural. And I'm like, you have a mural <laughs> on the wall? Yeah, 
on the wall? Yeah, he's, he's beloved here in Seattle. He really is. Had it not been for the injury, Steve would be an elite star. I record all the EPL games, so I'm probably recording this game right now, you know, watching him in the, in the, in the top leagues, whether it's in England or Spain, Italy, wherever it was, you know. I think he would have ended up where he wanted to be. I never knew Steve was this smart, very smart, you know. Growing up, you know, I didn't know that. And whatever he does, I know he's going he's gonna to succeed in it. If you told me, oh, Steve's going to be, you know, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company 10 years from now, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Or he might secretly be just releasing a mixtape. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Uh, try to prove me wrong. If you've been to Rock Bottom, I've been there, but there's life after the storm. And I've come out smiling and hoping to inspire everyone else to do the same. Uh, that's my only only motivation at this point in my life. My man, Steve, you've changed, man. No, I'm kidding, but you know how I feel about you. I'm always here for you, you're always here for me, and uh, I wish uh, nothing but the best for you, and I'm excited for your future, and. Uh, I'm wishing you all the best. I'm very proud of you for your career, not only your soccer career, but your other goals and ambitions that you had outside of the field. For all that you accomplished on the field, um, as proud of you uh, for everything that you've done off the field. I appreciate you. I look forward to many more years of friendship. We'll see you soon, my friend. You know, if I was just a little bit fitter, um, I think I probably could still take you on a one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, Steve, man, you know, just... Don't get fat, you know? I see you get a bit fat, you know what I mean? Lay off the pieces. <laughs> no, it is, man. We're, we're here in England. When are going to come back? We're here for you, bruv. And I don't want to see out yet, but I'll come see out very soon and see you over there. Just keep doing what you're doing, big man. You have my respect. Um, I consider you a friend, and um, I always am cheering for you. So. I wish you well. Keep doing what you're doing, and you know I'm here to support you in anything you do. I know what you're capable of, and I know that you're gonna achieve something that is gonna change this world. I was one of their best players. One of their best players. I was known in the all area. I can say now that I was a superstar at that time. I had the natural talent, natural talent, but which was not developed. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Yeah.